So today, this is going to be, it's not of uh, Epistock 360, because I'm sure, like, uh, looking at the, the list of people who, who registered for the event today, uh, it's all like a lot of uh, existing customers, partners, and people who already know a little bit about uh, 360. So today, we are going to focus purely on some of the features we introduced in this uh, latest uh, 7.9 release. Uh, so we, re we released a few weeks ago. Uh, today, like you know, like uh, uh, I, I'm going to present. This is Saravana Kumar, and I also have Ricardo Torre with me, who, who will also present a couple of features uh, in in the product. So we are not going to have too many slides. I just put down this uh, couple of slides. Uh, so one is this intro, and uh, it, this is just the agenda of uh, the, the four key features what we introduced in uh, 7.9, and we are going to see it in a bit more uh, detail. So the as part of the 7.9 release, it's even though it looks like a small incremental release, uh, like a, from 7.8 to 7.9, but in terms of the is is quite uh, substantial. So uh, once we, you see the demo, then probably you will realize that the depth of the features, uh, what's been included uh, in this in this release. So at the top level, like these are the four features. The, the first one is the import-export capability, which allows you to move your configuration between environments. The second is data monitoring, which is like we, we built in like a, like a brand new monitoring capability, uh, to keeping all the data points in, in, in BizTalk, like a message box, tracking, BAM, EDI, ESB, et cetera. And we also improved the EDA capabilities in the product. Like in the previous versions, we only had the reporting uh, capabilities, but now we extended it to include parties and agreements. So you get a full web-based access for uh, parties and agreements. And finally, we also improved on the ESB uh, side of things uh, because in the, we've been having ESB for a long time. Uh, so it's mainly on the looking at the, the, the fault messages that's been logged into the ESB exception database. And did re and resubmit functionality, which was a quite a big ask for a very long time. And we also brought a new capability called bulk resubmit. If you uh, so, which the EDA and ESB part will be covered by Ricardo uh, in the later part of the demo, and I, I will be focusing on the first two features: the import, export, and data monitoring. So, slide-wise, uh, that's all I have. So, we'll just dive straight into the into the demo. Okay, so so I'm just accessing one of our uh, test environments. So this is owned by Ricardo, and it's actually running in uh, in uh, Azure. Uh, so so as I mentioned, like you know, like we are going to go straight into the the four features. The first feature is the the import export uh, capability. So monitoring and notification. So you you probably will all all, all know the the monitoring and notification capabilities. So I just start off with you know like a simple demonstration like you know what is this monitoring and notification. So we have this concept called concept, and we also made some subtle UI UX experience improvements because this is something new. In the past, you only had like a generic alarm, so it always goes through the complete list of uh, 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 list of stages whether you're creating threshold alarm or a data monitoring alarm or a health check alarm, but we made some simple improvement here. So for example, if I'm creating threshold alert, I, I can just go, go and click this one. So you will cut down on the unnecessary steps. So I can say I wanted to monitor the SAP integration uh, scenario. Uh, and I can give my uh, bunch of email addresses where I wanted to get notified. And as part of the threshold alarm, we have few settings like uh, you can say how long the, the situation should persist in your environment. Uh, the default is 10 minutes, but you know, depending upon the scenario, you can say two minutes or 20 minutes, whatever you think is appropriate. And you also have few options like limiting the number of alerts you receive and getting a notification when things become not you wanted to restrict it to only to specific hours like Monday to Friday, nine to five, you, you can do that. So you don't want to get unnecessary alerts in the in the midnight or something. So you can if you want you can if you prefer you can do that. And you also have some advanced settings. But just for this uh, 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 demo I'm just going to leave it as it is. 
and once the alarm is created then uh, con configuring monitoring is pretty simple i can go to different artifacts for example i can go to applications and i can choose the application which i wanted to monitor and i can pick up that uh, alarm i just created just now and i can say i wanted to as part of this integration i wanted to monitor a bunch of receive locations a bunch of send ports uh, and i can go to completely different application uh, i can say like i wanted to monitor this as well as part of this sap integration and i can select them and i say must be started and i can go to bistock server and uh, you know i can say i wanted to monitor disks i wanted to monitor uh, system resources like cpu memory etc demonstration because the idea is you know once the alarm is created you can go and configure various things like a sql server a sql jobs a host instances and all those kind of things what you typically expect you will you need to monitor in bistock so one of the new features what we brought in the 7.9 is this import export capability so let me explain the reason why we brought this functionality like uh, we did bunch of interviews with a lot of our existing customers and we re realized like uh, like some of the larger medium to large scale customers have lots of alarms so in this case we have only 3 but if you imagine if it's like a, like a like a large bistock implementation and you have lo lot of scenarios where you are connecting multiple systems together and some of the customers had something like 200 plus alarms configured to cover various scenarios and one of the pain point for them is actually like uh, moving that configuration from one environment to another environment so as you can imagine there are like lot of regular scenarios in a qa or a staging environment and then later they wanted to move that config to a production environment so in the previous versions the only option is is to you, you need to do it manually Uh, even though we have like a really good ui ux experience to go and configure it because it it is a pain point to do it manually every time so this was one of the ask for a very long time and and uh, and we brought it in this release so the exporting is very simple like you just go and click the button and it will just export the file uh, as a as a as a zip file and uh, you that contain that will contain all your configuration so it's a zip file but internally we maintain bunch of json files the idea is you know over a period like we will use this capability to import export lot of things in in bistock 360 or so things like you know user configuration uh, so whatever it comes as a configuration uh, in the future releases we will be adding the capability to uh, import export everything right now the, the import export is only restrict only uh, So like export button just exported everything that's available in this uh, uh, in this environment so the import is where it gets really interesting and uh, it's it's quite intense in terms of uh, uh, the the reason why it took so long for us to uh, build it so as you can see like you know like i clicked on the import uh, option and there are like a five steps we need to go through to before we can import some stuff into the environment so i'm going to select a file so this time i'm going to actually select a different file i'm not going to select the one i just exported so this is a file we actually uh, you know exported from one of our qa environments and if i open that file you can see it's just loading and there's like you know 250 alarms that's present in in that qa environment so now you have an option you know whether you can you wanted to import everything uh, that's available in this uh, in this alarm or you can be very specific and say like you know i wanted to pick up these four or five alarms i wanted to bring it into this new in, into this current and like for example you know the default status is uh, is uh, to keep the alarms in a disabled uh, status because when you import it you don't want the alarms to trigger and send some false emails to people that's already configured so by default you keep it as a disable but if you want you can you can enable it uh, straight away like you can do one by one or you can do it at a group level the based on the selections you have done and if you want you can also change the name of the alarm you may want to change it from qa to production or something like that you can do that and we also have options for uh, uh, duplicate handling the default behavior is to throw an error if you detect a duplicate alarm in the in, in, in the environment you are importing but if you want you can you have an option to override as well so you can simply say i want to override this 
with what whatever current configuration you have in the environment and also we have an option to change the email ids because you know the, the qa team may be different from a production team so when you are importing i can say i wanted to make sure the new alarms are configured to send emails to this particular uh, email so happy with all these things i can click next so here this is where it gets uh, interesting because when you are moving things from one environment to another environment there will always be things which are uh, different for example you know the bistock server names are going to be different the sql server instances are going to be different uh, the sql server names are going to be different so based on the alarms you have selected it will show you like uh, you know like the, these things need to be mapped so if you have multiple servers in that uh, in that configuration it will list all of them but in this case uh, i just exported it from one of our normal qa environment which had only one server so this is showing like a qa1 and you can you can actually map it to you know whichever servers available in this particular environment i'm importing so again this is one of our test environment and i have only one server but if you have multiple bistock servers available in this group you will have an option to select whichever ones is 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 appropriate so i'm just going to choose this one uh, these are the available things and i can click next and this gives record and uh, you know these are the mappings uh, we have done uh, and if you are, if you if you want to change it you can go back and change it and you will also have a option to see exactly like uh, what's contained in each one of this alarm so in this case you can see there are four receive locations mapped and you can see there are some eight send ports mapped here so you can go through it and we wanted to give you enough confidence like uh, you know things uh, the uh, what you're going to import into the environment and once you're happy with all the things you just go and say import and everything gets imported if you close the visa and i can see all this uh, five, you know five or six alarms got imported and this is the new email address it's got mapped to and you can you can open up and see what is the what is the configuration um, for this one so this you know as you can see it is really powerful and it also opens up opportunities for a, a few scenarios now for example you know like one of the scenario we can think of is a lot of the consulting companies uh, uh, you know you provide service to your customers you know as a consulting company with expertise on bistock you can build up your own uh, file Uh, which contains all the configurations right you can have like a very fine level configuration like uh, uh, you wanted to monitor for specific event ids you want to make sure the certain services are running you wanted to make sure some you know some data monitoring is in place so all those kind of the power of the entire uh, bistock 360 you can configure it and you can keep it like your master file and whenever you go to a specific customer uh, site you can install 360 and take your master file and you just map it to the customer uh, environment and uh, you know within like a 15 20 minutes you will have like a really powerful uh, monitoring capability for your customers so this is you know like uh, this just opens up uh, opportunities like this and we are also seeing uh, like we are also thinking like as a company since we deal with a lot of uh, bistock customers and uh, there are a lot of uh, customers using the product we can also we are also thinking of maintaining a master mapping so that's something you know we are we are looking at it and we probably will bring like a master a master file at some point so this works like like a something like a management pack so you import this pack and then all the monitoring is 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 there within like a 15 20 minutes so so this is one of the the key feature uh, we introduced in in 7.9 okay let me move on to the next feature so the next feature is what we call it as a data monitoring uh, capability so some of you may be aware like in you know in the previous versions of uh, bistock 360 we had this uh, feature called uh, process monitoring so the process monitoring basically allows you to you know monitor for uh, uh, certain things like uh, you know your transaction volume Uh, for example i can have something like uh, let me create a new process monitoring i can say you know expecting uh, 400 uh, messages from uh, sap every 15 minutes i can do something like that and i can say i'm expecting greater than 400 and i can go and pick up the assume this is the you know this is the something uh, this is the sap port and this is where your vol 
messages are going to come in. I can pick that up. And we have a, like a very powerful scheduling capability. So I can say I wanted to monitor every 15 minutes. And I can be, you can also say things like, you know, I wanted to monitor only on a weekly basis and I wanted to monitor Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Uh, or I can say I wanted to monitor daily every 15 minutes. And you can say, you know, a specific business hours, you know, nine to five, or it's going to be monitored all day. And when do you want to check it? You know, whether every 15 minutes or only at the end of the business day. So it's a, this, this gives you like a really, really powerful uh, scheduling capability in terms of, you know, the frequency in which you wanted to test this, uh, this thing. So in this case, I'm saying, you know, 400 messages every 15 minutes. So I can see, you know, I just selected every 15 minutes daily frequency and I can say click, uh, click and save it. So once this is done, you know, the system will keep monitoring it and then it will, it, if, if you're, if you're not getting the volume. So this is something we built uh, in the, in the 7.8, the previous versions of, uh, of 360. But while we are building that capability, like uh, we thought, you know, a lot of things in a long term, like, you know, uh, the scheduling capability, we know we can take advantage of it. And that's why we made it really very generic and we made it as a really powerful component inside 360. So what we have done in 7.9, we just extended that capability to all the data points available in, in 360. Uh, for example, you know, like you can see the message box, tracking, BAM, EDA, ESB, et cetera. So it's all now uses the same mechanism. Uh, in fact, the message box is even more powerful. Let me quickly show you what you can do with the message box data. So what I can do now is, you know, this is something people do uh, right now is as a manual process, like a lot of you. Uh, I can say, you know, watch out, uh, watch out for uh, uh, suspended messages in application. Terminate them every uh, 15 minutes, something like that. So you, you can see what, what condition I'm trying to achieve. Like, you know, this is something people do it regularly, right? So you go to your environment, open the admin console, you check for suspended messages and people either resume it or terminate it. All those kind of day-to-day -day operational activities, now it can be automated using this new feature. So now I can say, you know, go to suspended service instances and I can add a filter. I can say it could be any specific application. Let's say, assume, and you know, I wanted to look out for this post purchase order application. And I can say when the instant status is, uh, is uh, non resumable. And the, I can even go a bit more very fine grain, like uh, things like uh, I can say, you know, if this contains a specific uh, error code or it contains some specific error description, something like, you know, P. P0, PO number 8768, uh, something like that. If it contains something with this prefix, you wanted to, you know, mo keep monitoring it and take action on it. So you can see this is properly here, and you can filter it, you know, whatever way uh, you want it. And then based on the result, you want to take some action. So you can say if this particular filter returns a bunch of uh, rows, and if the row count is, you know, greater than 10, it's my warning level. And if it's greater than 200, it could be your error threshold. So you can configure that. And you can also click this box. Then what would, what will happen is it will, it will, you know, take a one instance of, of this. It, it will group by and it will give you like a one instance of the description in your email. So you can e easily look at your email and say what's failing. Uh, so once you have done that, uh, the, the scheduling part is exactly the same what we have seen in the uh, in the the process monitoring side because we reuse that component so it's exactly the same and this is where it gets uh, really interesting you can now take action so you know when this condition is met i can say i want to take an action and you have few options you can you can say either you wanted to take an action every time or only when it reaches a Just simply wanted to go and terminate all those instances. So you can, if you, just to summarize, you know, there are quite a lot of info here. So I set up a filter uh, based on whatever error condition I'm uh, looking for. And then I just set up an action saying on when it reaches an error condition, I wanted to terminate them. I can just simply save and close it. And the system will keep looking for that condition. And, uh, and when this is met, it will automatically, you know, terminate that because we asked it to ask the system to terminate under that condition. So, 
So this is a, you know like a, a, on the message box side, and you have a similar set of uh, capabilities for other things as well. The only the filter conditions will change. So if you go to tracking, and if you look at the, the current configuration, you can see you know instances going to specific URL, and you can say a tracked message events if it's going to the specific URI. It may be something like you know you're integrating with Dynamics CRM, and if it contains so many of them, and you wanted to get notified like a. So you, you 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 can you you can do that. At the EDA, the ESB is equivalent to the ESB alerting functionality what you had in the the sample portal. So we just brought it you know straight into this uh, into this data monitoring because we wanted to keep all the data monitoring capabilities at one point. A BAM is equivalent to the BAM notifications. Uh, you, you know, like uh, you probably know, like uh, setting a BAM notification is a kind of a real pain. Like uh, you need to make sure the SQL notification service is running, and then you need to have a BAM portal and all those kind of things. So we brought that capability in as a, as part of this data monitoring. I can go to this one, and this is a uh, something we have really interesting here because uh, because BAM is very generic, right? Because uh, the filter conditions are going to be based on the views and activities what you define. So one of the things what you can do is, you know, if you look and look at this one, how do you want to check? I can actually choose a date time column. I can say like, for example, you know, like uh, uh, I can I can pick up uh, uh, something which has a date time stuff and I can say activity view. Let's uh, I'm assuming is something. OK. Time column, those columns will be available for you to choose it. So you're not really blindly looking at the result count. You can do a range on the date time. So you can say, for example, you can do watch out for you know something between 10 to 10:30, 10:30 to 11, something like that. And once you save and close it, and the system will will keep monitoring it. So this is on the configuration side. And we know like when you're doing something automatic like this, it's very important to have a clear visibility of you know what the system is doing behind the scene. So to address that, we brought we built a brand new dashboard called Data Monitoring Dashboard. So if you look at the dashboard, it's a calendar view, and you can see you, you got a filtering option. So in this case, you know you have configured process monitoring and message box queries for this particular date, and it's all looking uh, green. But when there is a problem, it will turn into red. So I can pick up any specific date, and I can see there is a you know, bunch of activities. Okay, there are some red ones here, and you can go to the red ones, and you can you can click on them. And it will tell you exactly, you know, like uh, you know, what them, and it will, it will tell you tell you, you know why you know it went into a failure state because you, your expected count is hundred, but it's actually the count at that particular time between nine to five on that particular day is, is zero because you didn't receive anything during that day, so that why that's why it it, it is a failure. So I can pick up on uh, something else. You know, this is a process monitoring side, and you can see, you know. Uh, so it's green because uh, uh, it, it didn't it, it didn't match that uh, it, it didn't match that uh, filter condition. So you can you know it, it, it we, uh, we I think there's some things missing like there's not enough data here. But you'll also see things like if there is an action taken, you will see a small gear icon showing the the what the action taken, and uh, and you you will uh, you you will get a clear visibility into uh, things uh, that's. Uh, uh, that's been happening in the environment. So those are the two things we introduced on the monitoring side. So let me, you know, just uh, pass it on to uh, to Ricardo. So he will cover the, the EDI and the, the. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so sort of when I covered two of the features that we introduced in Port Export and Data Monitoring, and now I'll touch on the other two. Uh, which were improvements on uh, EDI and uh, ESP. So let's start with EDI. And so if you, if you use the previous version, uh, you'll know that uh, we, uh, we introduced the uh, EDI status report. And, uh, and now we also expand that to include parties. And um, the, the main idea was we, we want you to be able to have visibility into how is EDI set up. So as a, as a EDI consumer, if your EDI application is not working, uh, you might need to go and see uh, how is my uh, current party configured. So I created uh, some, some data here, and uh, we have here the ability for you to visualize all the parties, business profiles, and agreements, as well as the fallback settings. So. <coughs> 
you can see here on the left hand side we are listing the actual parties and then we also have the business profile Uh, on, the, on the right hand side you can see agreements and the agreements will be showing depending on what is selected. So if I select the particular business profile here you see that the matching agreements are, are loading just the ones filtered by that particular profile. <clears throat> Uh, another important part is that I want to know how is my party configured. So I can go and click on the properties window and I, I will open a detailed pane where I can see all the different sections of configuration. So in this case, this is a party. There isn't many options there, but you can see here the general send ports and certificate tabs. But if I go back, I can see a lot more in interesting information if I go into a particular business profile. So let's say if I go into this AS2 profile, I will be able to see um, the, the general settings of that profile, but also the protocol settings. In this case, I have protocol settings for AS2, and I can go and see all the properties of these particular AS2 settings. Uh, so we have uh, for AS2, bound settings and outbound settings, and we can see all the different sections that affect the behavior of EDI. So in this case, I just have one protocol setting, so that's why we just have one tab. But if I go here into a different one where I have multiple uh, protocol settings, we can see you know, X12 related settings, and uh, we can see inbound and outbound AS2 and EDI settings. So the idea is that we are, you are able to completely understand how is these uh, parties and profiles uh, configured. And then we can also go and click on the uh, agreements and if I click on a particular agreement I'll be able to see the configuration of the agreement so I'll, I'll be able to see that the, the general settings where I can understand how it is configured and then specific settings depending on the direction of messages that you are sending so we can see here uh, the, from one to the other and then vice versa we can see all the relevant information so let me just Um, the, so now you can see, it's instead of just simply being able to run the reports and understanding how messages are being exchanged through the EDI capabilities, you can also understand how the parties are configured, which kind of justifies how the messages are being processed there. And uh, another important thing is that you also need to understand how are the default settings for X12 and Edifact configured so that you can uh, better understand the behavior. So we can also go and load those profiles which is, are essentially generic profiles that are applied to every other uh, settings. So you can see here on the general settings, <coughs> we have information on you know, if EDI reporting is enabled, if we're using fallback settings, etc. And we have the specific X12 agreement with all the uh, particular settings that affect EDI as a global thing. And we also, we, this is the X12 one, but we also have the Edifact uh, with the, the same corresponding uh, capabilities. As you might know, you, you can have a lot of parties in your environment, and so the ability to search for exactly what you are looking for uh, it, it is quite useful. So if I go and send, okay, I want to search by, for my vendor one, uh, you can see here on the left hand side, we automatically filter it so that we have only the the parties that uh, match this particular um, uh, search criteria. Okay, this is what's new in the in EDI. So we included parties and all the navigation capabilities to be able to visualize parties, business profiles, agreements, and the fallback settings, including some uh, easy to use search uh, capability. Um, so this is on EDI. Let's go into ESP exceptions. So we, we, we have built this ESP exception management capability to help you with the, the, that difficulty that is quite common for whoever uses uh, the ESP um, toolkits and to easily deploy a portal that you can use to navigate through your faults and understand what's happening in the environment. And so we, we built this querying capability in the past, so you, you can go and run a query against the, 
your ESP exception database and we can then go and, and see which faults exist here. Uh, we can apply our normal reach querying capability. We can you know, filter uh, per application. For instance, I could go and say I want for a very specific application to see all the faults uh, and, and, and apply any other, any other filtering. So depending on what you want to find. Uh, in my case, I just want to go and see a few uh, of the messages. And, um, and so this is one of the capabilities that we improved recently, which is I now want to see my message. And you can see here uh, we have a, a, a rich UI for uh, displaying XML messages. And then we um, allow you to see all the related properties, like you can see the context of the message and the general message. We went back one screen so we can also see the fault viewer and the fault viewer essentially has all the fault related properties and so we can understand why is this message here so this was actually a message that could not be routed in BizTalk. we can see any messages associated with the, the particular fault and in this case i even have a knowledge base article related to this particular type of fault so uh, one of the things that we, we actually built as new in this 7.9 release is the ability for now you to change a message and resubmit it back to BizTalk so that you can you know, correct a malformed message or uh, maybe you are, you are submitting messages through uh, your solution and there was some kind of connectivity problem and you had a lot of faults here. And so it's important for, uh, for you to be able to uh, not only visualize the message but also adjust it to match what, you, what you, your solution is expecting and also um, making sure that the business process is not stuck and that you can get, take it to the next stage. So as I, as I was showing, I a routing problem but uh, it could be something else and if I wanted I could go and change the message and now I could uh, simply come here and uh, edit my message and then I you know once I'm happy with the result of the message uh, I will be uh, able to now choose from one of the receive locations where that I have available to resubmit messages uh, into this talk and I can now hit resubmit and now what this will do is will call the service on the back end to in this case it will call the on ramp um wcf on ramp to put the message back into bistock and now it will be reevaluated by the subscriptions and eventually continue on processing so you can see now i've, I've added to the message i changed it and it's been uh, successfully resubmitted to the wcf So, and this is uh, for editing and resubmitting a particular message. We also have created the ability here is uh, a lot of times you get messages into your ESP exception uh, database, which were not really meant to go there because they are just connectivity problems. And in those cases, what you normally want to do is just want to resubmit all of them back to BizTalk so that they can continue once that connectivity problem is solved. And so what we enable is now that you can select a bunch of messages and you can say, okay, I want to go and send them back to BizTalk. So I'm going to select here which port I want to submit it to and I can now hit submit. And you can see uh, we have a, a results pane where we are showing you uh, which messages we are trying to, to submit and what was the result and you can see all the messages that have been successfully resubmitted back to BizTalk. And so now you can see that we are actually sending messages to BizTalk so this is something that you want to know who did it and when. And so we also improved our ESB, uh, sorry, our that you can uh, actually uh, understand uh, what was done in terms of message resubmission. So if I jump here into governance and auditing, and now I go into ESP message activities, uh, you can see here uh, that we, we keep a log of all those resubmitted messages. And you can even go and click on a particular message to see what was resubmitted and the general properties of that message. And uh, as, as uh, Saravana mentioned, so this is actually also part of the ESP improvements uh, in data monitoring. We also include you the ability for, to you, 
for you to run ESB queries and based on the result of those queries uh, to uh, monitor for particular scenarios and then you can be alerted of certain ESB faults that are in your database. And uh, I think we covered it all. Uh, I know. I think we should now open for Q and A. I guess, I guess uh, we are already answering some of the questions. But yeah, you know, it's not going to be one full hour. Uh, so what you can do is, if you have uh, some questions, uh, you can type it on the chat window. Because if I open the audio, it's going to be really bad for uh, everybody. Not uh, you can't hear anything. So the best thing is, you know, if you can type it, type it in the chat window, then uh, we can we can answer the answer your questions. I already seen some questions coming along with the the ESB resubmit functionality. Uh, the one the uh, the the just to understand the concepts correctly here. So what we have done is, you know, is identical to what the ESB exception portal was doing. So it's a, the the concept wise, it's pretty identical. So you have all those limitations, restrictions, whatever you had on the ESB uh, exception portal. So the only, the biggest advantage here is because you know the ESB portal is is is, is, a, is a sample application, and it had you know some bugs, and the setting it up is a really pain, and uh, people, a lot of people may you know spend a lot of time on maintaining that code base. So that's exactly you know like, uh, by introducing it right into 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 360. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now so that we may, you know, post it for later and we'll just keep answering your questions. Sir.